Hey folks, have you ever been interested in concert photography or photographing musicians? Well, stay tuned because in this next interview, I'm speaking with someone who's been doing it for quite a while. This is Twit. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today I have the distinct pleasure of sitting down with Jay Blakesburg. He is a, uh, you, I, I, I hesitate to use the word veteran photographer when I talk to many photographers, but Jay is a veteran photographer. He knows his way around the camera. He knows his way around light. He probably has forgotten more about photography and getting the image than many of us know today. And because of him being locked down, I got him on the show <laughs> and, and I get to pick his brain on how uh, how he's built up such a storied career shooting music and musicians and that kind of thing. So, Jay, welcome to the show, man. It's good to have you. You too. A, a veteran photographer. God, I'm only 17 years old. I'm a veteran already. Well, you need to stop doing what you're doing because <laughs> if you're only 17, 17, you're in trouble. With my my white beard. <laughs> yeah. So you're you're in San Francisco. You're a San Francisco based photographer, and uh, you know, well, for the people that are watching this and that or will look at the blog post, they'll see some of your images, and I encourage them to go over to your website, which we'll link to um, uh, from the blog post and the description in the YouTube video. But let's just start from the beginning, man. You sure. you not the beginning beginning, but just you know give it set the stage for us you know so to speak on the how you got into this type of photography music shooting musicians and celebrities and that kind of thing so i grew up in suburban new jersey in the 1970s i went to high school from 1975 to 1979 and uh, back then we didn't have the internet to tell us how to act or how to live or what to do uh, <laughs> we were kind of on our own and uh you know, we pretty much lived for sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, and, uh, you know, the drugs were easy to get and ingest. Um, the rock and roll was everywhere. The sex, we were just praying that we could get some. It <laughs> was a little bit harder to come come, come, uh, come up with. Uh, the first two were supposed to help with the last one, right? <laughs> exactly. That's why everybody says they become a musician is for the girls, right? Uh -huh. And um, and so, uh, you know, trying to find and figure out my identity of who I was. I loved having a camera. I loved taking pictures of my friends, uh, my friends. It was, it was the early days of social media, you know, mm -hmm. take some photos, develop them in the dark room and, and give them to your friends to hang on their bedroom walls, uh, or, or just to have, and, and, uh, you know, early, early forms of kind of sharing content and, uh, I built a dark room in my mother's basement uh, where I lived in high school. Uh, in my senior year of high school, they built a dark room in my high school. 1979, the teacher for the photography class was the auto shop teacher. He's the guy teaching how to change your oil and fix a, you know, change a carburetor or change your spark plugs or whatever it is they were doing in, in uh, uh, you know, we, we call those people the grease monkeys, whatever they were doing over there. But he knew how to develop film. So he be, by default became the photography teacher. And uh, I was the very, very first student to make a print in that darkroom in 1979. And here I am, you know, 50 years later, 40 years, 40 years later, and still still doing it. Not 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 sniffing fixer in a darkroom, but uh, still working as a professional photographer. Yeah. And uh, so that's kind of, you know, that was kind of the beginning uh uh, at first I was borrowing my, my dad's camera, borrowing a, uh, my stepbrother's camera, uh, borrowed my dad's camera, took it to a Grateful Dead concert in 1978. First time I photographed the Grateful Dead. Um, and then, uh, uh, just, you know, was just taking pictures. And I think I was for my 17th birthday. My dad bought me a Yashica. I think mm -hmm. it was an FX one. I think is what it was, no, FR1 maybe, one or the other, I can't remember, I have to go back and look. Yeah. And um, and uh, started just taking pictures of my friends and, and uh, bringing it to concerts and shooting music uh, so that I could go take that film and, and, and uh, develop it in the basement and make some eight by 10 prints and hang them on my wall in my bedroom. Wow. Uh, create my own concert memorabilia. 
And uh, some of those photographs now, you know, 40 years later are actually valuable and, and have shown up in CD packages and box sets and, and magazines, you know, pictures that I took when I was 17 and 18 years old uh, actually had some sort of uh, commercial value, historical value. Uh, mm. monetary value on the commercial side. Um, and there's so just what, what was it, culture. what was it about the photography that got you hooked in it? I mean, you've, you clearly, the, the hook was embedded deep, right? So what, what was it? The, the relationship, you know, with light, was it the, the fascination with like the mechanics and the gear and all that stuff or the, the relationships that you build, like you said, you know, the social networking back then that you milled with people, what was it that kept the fuel going that kept Jay wanting to take more pictures? I think that people liked the photographs that I was taking. I got mm -hmm. positive feedback, whether those photographs were really good or not as a, as another story. Um, and, uh, so, you know, we all lack confidence and self-esteem and, you know, typical teenage things. And so when you're taking a photograph and giving it to a friend or a girl or your buddy and they're hanging it on their wall and telling you that it's a great photo, you know, it sort of inspires you a little bit. Right. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had this thing that was sort of helping to identify who I was and, uh, you know, where I fit into the script and I really also got turned on by, you know, in the old days, dropping that blank piece of paper in that developer bath yeah. and watching that magic image, you know, come up and um, and uh, uh, become a, a, a photograph. It really was a magical, magical experience and uh, one that we we cherished every time it happened and we you know, believed in that magic and loved that magic and, uh, um, want to keep doing that magic. I remember one time I had some negatives and a negative page. I always kept all my negs in those, you know, plastic neg pages, uh, in strips. And I remember like getting some negatives and being with my buddy, like in my bedroom and, you know, typical, you know, school night where we're smoking pot, drinking beer and, and playing poker and like, you know, trying to get him to like look at the negatives in a loop on the light bulb in my room and <laughs> being like, you know, look at how great this is and the exposure. And, and he was just busy like, you know, like, what are you even talking about? Like, this means nothing to me. It, you know, it, it says nothing. It means nothing. It makes me feel nothing. And for me, like, like I'm practically like, you know, just bursting with joy over this properly exposed photograph of a musician that I loved and photographed yeah. and just amazed that I actually was able to get the right exposure and the, and be in focus at the same time, you know, I see that, that would, what do you think, you know, that, that begs the question, you and I have talked about this uh, a little bit before, but the, you know, if, if you fast forward from those days to today, Right. And and we've got, you know, all manner of tools and, you know, some of them borderline magical being able to see in the dark these cameras and software and post-production and ways to share the images online instantaneously on and on and on. Do you think that joy that you had of looking at that negative through the loop against a, a bare light bulb, that kind of I, I remember that. Right. That little electricity jolt that you get. You're like, oh, my God, I can't wait to get in the dark room to print this. And I want to see what I actually got. We were turned on. We were. Yeah. Turned on like from that. You yeah. Know? Is that like, gone, though? Do you think that's that, so, is that gone? Um, yes and no. Uh, I feel I feel bad for photographers that never got to experience souping their own film and making their own prints. Um, I feel bad and weird that a lot of photographers um, don't know about photographers that were doing that. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Irving Penn was in the dark room making prints himself, you know, at a certain point, Richard Avedon was, and if not right in there, you know, in the dark room, making notes and giving direction to his printer. Um, you know, so, so there's all these photographers out there that had these experiences. Um, but, uh, and we talked about this a little bit last week when I was on your, when I was the special guest on your, your Friday night cocktail shebang, well, yeah. uh, Frederick Van Johnson's worldwide cocktail shebang on a front. <laughs> and um uh and i got to um 
you know, I, I talked about how when we download these photos into the computer and they pop up in Lightroom and you immediately want to blow them up and see if they're sharp in the eyes and if it's a little bit dark but you love the shot, see if it's got the latitude in it to bring it up and make it explode off of the screen, right? So, yeah, I'm still fucking turned on by by that magic. It's just a different kind of magic than it was, you know, back then in the day when we were – when we were um, kids, yeah. Do you do you do you think the like the kids today? You know, I don't want to sound like the old fogey, but the kids today that are that are learning photography, that are excited by it, is it? Are they missing sort of you know an an, an atom or some DNA because they didn't go through, they didn't walk over the hot, hot coals of having to do it with chemistry and uh, they're using Lightroom and Capture One now, or is I it just a they, different kind of hot coals? I think it's a different kind of hot coals. I I, yeah. I don't want to discount people that never got to experience that. Yep. But I think that if you're serious about photography, I think that there still are rental dark rooms out there. I think that you should jump in a dark room and make a print or try and make a print. Yeah. Um, you know, understand what, you know, real dodging and burning is and where that came from, which we do in the computer now in Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever it is you're using. Um, you know, you're still using those skills. Like, so the, the very first guy that I had worked for me, uh, actually he was the second guy, but he was the, really the main guy that really got my digital studio up and running he was a master black and white printer at a lab here in San Francisco, and I stole him away. And uh, he was still a, actually he had just finished he had just dropped out of art school, but he knew the zone system. You know, he knew the work of Ansel Adams. He knew how to make a beautiful, beautiful print in a dark room, yeah. right? And he was able to translate those skills to the computer screen. And, and take my photographs and make them pop off the page in a way that he was also able to do in the darkroom. And I think that that helped him. The next guy that I had work for me um, after Paul left, so Paul was that guy, the printer, was a guy named Ben. And he started working for me when he was 19, I think, 19 years old. And he had just graduated from a photography program on the East Coast, and he studied retouching was his specialty. Mm -hmm. And his skills were greater than Paul's, but different. Paul even taught him things, even though Paul never learned proper retouching in school because he brought those skills from the darkroom. And so Ben then had Paul mentor him a little bit and his stuff that he learned in his photography program on the East Coast – and he became this incredible digital tech, working magic in a digital darkroom, we'll call it. I love that. I love it. All right. There's so much to, to talk about, Jay, in, in terms of the different directions this conversation could take. You know, we could talk about uh, gear. We could talk about lighting. We could talk about software, post-processing, all that. Um, I want to talk a little bit before we start looking at your work. I want to talk a little bit about the stuff that you use to make this work and your philosophy around light. I remember when I first got started in photography uh, and nerding out in the military about photography it was light that got me most excited and understanding photons and the physics and the speed of light and all that. Can you talk a little bit about that, like your your relationship to to light and how you sure. managed to sort of internalize it? So I think that. Um I think it I think you start to understand light as you mature as a photographer and you see how it reacts to your foot to your photographs whether you're shooting on film uh, you know I'm self-taught as a photographer a hundred percent I did take some photography classes in college but all my portraiture work all my lighting all my artificial lighting all my strobe lighting I'm self-taught and I think I'm very good at it. I think there's a lot of people that are mind blowing at it. And I look at, you know, different Instagram feeds of, you know, people that are just masters of light. I'm not a technical person in general. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not a math geek, right? So I don't, mm -hmm. I'm not able to 
whittle it down to, you know, parabolic, you know, umbrellas and diffusers and, you know, ratios and stuff like that. I mean, I understand how my Dynalite packs work and, you know, doubling the power and halving the power. It's the same thing as doubling your shutter speed or your aperture or your ISO. It's all in stops and quarter stops and half stops and, you know, things like that. Yeah. And, uh, and I could look at a Polaroid or I could look at a digital file and I could say that highlight is too much. I don't like that shadow. How do I fill that shadow when I understand all of those things? But it took me a long time to get to that. And then in terms of just, you know, regular light, I think that as we, you know, roll into digital photography and you have the, the ability to sort of instantaneously check exposure and stuff like that, um, you know, it's a little bit easier than let's say, you know, doing a test Polaroid and another test Polaroid and mm -hmm. let's say you're shooting at sunset and you're trying to get that beautiful backlit, blown out, you know, shot, um, you know, all at once and you're doing all these test Polaroids and all of a sudden the sun dips below the horizon and you're done and you missed it, right? You know, whereas now, I mean, I could take a picture, look at the back of my viewfinder and I can make an adjustment within seconds come very close and then make do it again and, and make one more adjustment and be ready to go. Right. And there's a lot of people that are, are, you know, can, can fit, you know, fidget with that forever. Okay. Should I, be should I be changing my ISO? Should be, I be changing my aperture? Should I be changing my shutter speed? You know, if I change my aperture, what do I have to do with my strobe output to adjust for that? And now the sun's going down. Now, how does the aperture change affect the sunset? And do I need to compensate with the shutter speed? Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. I can, you know, and I'm not a math person. I'm like, you know, I'm just, I've never been, I can't do it. Um, it's my ADD. I was never able to concentrate doing any math classes in high school. I never took anything like that in college. It's just not in my DNA. And, uh, but I can solve those equations incredibly fast. And, uh, and I think that that's, you know, as a live concert photographer, I think that makes gives you an upper hand in terms of getting a great photograph is to be able to solve the, that problem incredibly quick, uh, uh, to get the correct exposure and to, you know, using the right shutter speed and the right, it's not just the correct exposure, but it's the correct exposure for the situation that for that scene. Yeah. And it's like, it's almost like you have superpowers because, because, <laughs> You know, you look at it and I, I, it's kind of true because you look at it from the standpoint of, um, you know, like we were talking about the supercomputers in our cameras today. Let us do all kinds of crazy stuff. And they offload all that math you were talking about to the processor and they they get it down to just you could put it on auto or intelligent auto or whatever. And press the button. It's going to evaluate the scene and give you something back. Right. right. It may not be exactly what you needed for that situation, but you're going to get a decent exposure back. But someone like you that understands what's happening with the light and can make those decisions, you can help guide the, the computer <laughs> to to yeah, do and, the, and, to and, do the right thing. Yeah, And it's interesting. I mean, I've you know, like I've gone to the Nikon booth at CES. Right. And had them show me some things that I just didn't know. Like I know there are all sorts of you know, buttons and filters and settings and scenes and, you know, pre pre program things in my camera that might make my life easier or make me a better photographer. But because I came from a camp, you know, an old school film camera where you had, you know, auto, no autofocus, manual focus, and you had shutter speed, ISO and aperture, and you got to figure it out, you know, so photography is obviously a, a, a science based art, right? And so, yeah. you know, nowadays, it's pretty easy to get the correct exposure, because we have the, you know, the idiot screen on the back of every camera. But, you know, when we shot film, you actually needed to know the technical skills to expose film properly, because if you did not have a properly exposed negative or slide, you had nothing. Right. Yeah. And, it, and it's two sides of one coin, though. Right. Because it could be on the one side, you like we were talking about hot coals. Right. You, there was a lot of effort and expertise involved to just getting to the point where you could internalize what's happening on that film when the light hits it. You know, that that what we call the learning loop. Right. I see a shot. I take a picture. I go develop the film. I print the film. It's crap. 
okay, let's go do it Stop, again and yeah. change change the settings. Right. Today, that was days, right? Or at least hours back then. Today, it's it's, it's seconds, it's seconds yeah. right? Yeah. So does that mean does that mean we have better photographers because they can that loop is going like this instead of like this? But like right. back then, um, I think it gives you the ability to become a better photographer faster. Right. Because, yeah, I used to shoot portraits of my roommates when I first started playing with studio strobe lighting. You know, I'd be like, go to my roommates and be like, OK, you sit here. I'm going to set up one light here and I'm going to put an umbrella on it. Oh, look at what that looks like now. And now I'm going to move that umbrella over to here. Now I'm going to move it over to here. Now I'm going to get the umbrella off and I'm going to bounce that light off the ceiling. Now I'm going to, you know, and, and, and every time you're taking a photo, you're doing it with a slide with slide film and a light meter. Right. And you're taking notes and you're saying, I shot this at 125 F4, um, you know, but my light reading, you know, but I put a gel on it, a, a half CTO. And I, I, oh, I compensated by opening up a stop. And here it is at the half stop open. And here's the quarter stop open. And here's the exact exposure based on the light meter. And then you're getting your slides back uncut and you're like comparing it to your notes and saying, oh, and you're right. Like, so I had to run to the lab and I had to drop my film off and it was ready in four hours and I could go back and get it or get it the next day. And then I'd go on the light table and I'd be like, okay, frame number one, I shot it at F4, but my meter read four and a half and F4 looks perfect. And here's one that I shot at four and a half. And wow, that's a, that's too dark. And now here's one with a gel on it. And it said F4 and it said F4 and a half, but I shot it at 2.8 and it's perfect because it's mm -hmm. absorbing all that yellow light. And wow, now I'm adding a blue gel and a green gel on the background. And now it's doing this and wait it, you know, and so you have all these notes and you're trying to figure it out. And when you go on a shoot, you're not taking those notes with you. Yeah. It's just in your, it's in your head. Like, okay, if I use this gel at this exposure in this situation, if I don't open up by a half a stop, I'm going to be underexposed and this is going to happen. But if I put this really heavy blue gel on it and over overexpose it by a full stop, I'm going to get this beautiful milky white skin, right? So there's all these things that you start learning on a creative level as well as a technical level. But again, it's this loop that takes hours, if not days, whereas now you can do the same thing, right? So yeah. uh, there's an online learn anything website called Skillshare. And, yeah. I, and I just finished making a six or seven or eight part beginner intermediate uh, photography class, right? I'm, I'm, I'm sheltering in place. My son is a video editor and he does work for Skillshare. And uh, so he said, hey, let's do a class, you know, because it created a, a work for him. It created yeah. a, an editing job for him. And so I agreed. And so he's been filming me down in my studio. And I really focused on doing a, the, the class project was creating an interesting portrait by playing with your depth of field and your shutter speed. And that was, you know, the big takeaway. And there's other stuff leading up to that and talking about event photography and shutter speed and, you know, the triangle that we talked, you know, you mentioned before ISO shutter speed uh, aperture and mm -hmm. how they all, and it's funny, I never call it the triangle. I just, but I guess that's what it really is. And I've heard that expression before, but, um, uh, and so, um, yeah, it's interesting with the, with like you like you talk about that circle or you know it's the the it's it's a circle and a triangle right because it's the circle that loop of learning right and until you can internalize it and then you're learning the exposure triangle right but, you know I wonder like back then it was expensive right to real, get exactly. to get good so, right real quick I was gonna say yes yeah, so yeah I had to like pay for that roll of film and develop yep. that roll of film and I'm a starving artist. Right. I'm living in a house with six roommates and my rent is one hundred and twenty five dollars a month that I could barely pay. And we're putting in ten dollars a week for communal food that I could barely come up with. Right. So to spend, you know, 20 bucks on a roll of slide film and development, you know, to to do this, whereas, you know, and, and the amount of time as well, whereas now. So it's just saying with the Skillshare thing, you know, I'm telling people what to do and you get instant results either by downloading it into your computer or even on the back of your camera, yeah. right? And so the the accelerated learning curve is like a rocket ship, right? You know, where you can learn what maybe took me weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months and months and hundreds of dollars in testing uh, film and emulsions and lighting. And, you know, do I like Kodachrome better than Ektachrome 100? And do I like Ektachrome 64? And do I like Fuji better than the Kodak? And do I like the TMZ 3200 Kodak black and white fast 
speed film shot at 800 1600 or 3200 what do i like best and yeah. right understand all you know so again you know it's this great expense and and i was not wealthy i had no money you know i had nothing and i had nobody giving me any money and i was doing it on my own and i was like i saw that the investment was worthwhile to learn these things but you were geeking out too right because I, I think you know you you replace one addiction with another right so you go from you know back in the day it was oh, like you mentioned all these different film types and speeds and grainy this and black and white and slow panatomic x versus high speed for this and then you know, you you, yeah. you flip over to the paper and the different filters that you could get to get different effects on the paper. We were geeking out about that stuff, right? And now I think people are geeking out about cameras and software, software. and it, yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I, I wonder. I wonder. You know, I'm curious about like before. I want to look at the gear, the some of the work that you do, but I'm curious about the gear that you've chosen to shoot with. Like, what 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 are the bodies and lenses that you run right. around with? So when I was a film shooter uh, in medium format, I was a Hasselblad guy, and I had a fisheye lens, which I think was a 30 for the Hasselblad. God, I haven't used it in over 10 years. Uh, I had a 30, a 40, a 50, an 80, and a 120 for my Hasselblad. And those were my lenses there. Um, and uh, and then I shot with a wide Lux, which is a panoramic camera. I shot with plastic toy cameras, the action sampler, the Holga. Um, I shot with um, uh, a four by five cheap Calumet brand four by five camera with some good lenses on it. Um, I shot with uh, Nikon and 35 millimeter for a long time. It was all prime lenses. When I'd go out and shoot a concert, I brought a, a 16 fisheye, a, a 24 millimeter 2.8, a 35 millimeter F2. Uh, uh, I, for a long time, I left the 50 millimeter at home. I uh, love my 50 millimeter now. Uh, an 85 F2, a 135 28, and a 180 28, and I had a 300 28. All those lenses were Nikon, except for my 300 millimeter 2.8 was a Tamron lens that I bought used from a guy in Santa Cruz decades ago. Tell me, and tell for, me, all those weren't in your camera bag, Jay? <laughs> yes, they were all. Yeah, if I went out to a show, I was out there with the tw 16, 24, 35, 85, 135, 180. Wow. And, and all in like fanny packs and camera bags and. You know, I had two or three bodies around my neck, one with color film, one with black and white film. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of digital shooters that shoot rock and roll, and they still like to have two camera bodies with, uh, uh, you know, a long lens and a short lens. So maybe a 24 to 70 on one camera and a 70 to 200 or a 14 to 24 and a, and a 24 to 70. I just like one body now, but I've got all my lenses in my harness packs. Uh, uh, I use... Um, uh, um, low low you know low gear low fan you know all those bags and belt oh, like low low pro low pro yeah, yeah. Low, low pro that's who i have all my gear with and i carry a lot of weight that kills my back and uh and uh you know but nowadays sometimes i'll go out and i'll be like okay i'm gonna bring my i'm gonna bring my 24 prime my 50 prime and my 105 prime and that's it you know, and I'll wow. go shoot like that and I'll be like, what about, what about zoom lenses? You know, zoom lenses have come a long way back in the day. It used to be zoom are, lenses are soft and now yeah, I yeah, still pretty good. You know, now that I've sort of, you know, what happened was, is I, I got tired of zoom lenses and I wanted to, I felt like I was shooting fish in a fishbowl. It was too easy for me. <laughs> you so wanted I, some challenge. <laughs> so I decided I wanted a challenge. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go out with just these prime lenses and just shoot with prime lenses and see what I can come up with. That's different. And so, you know, so I might just go out with those three lenses I mentioned, 24, 50, 105, and then maybe I'll bring like my 14 to 24 just in case. If it's like a small venue that I know I'm going to be up close, maybe I might want to bring that 14 to 24. But on my Zoom side of things with Nikon, uh, I have a 14, 24, 28, 24, 70, 28, 70, 200, 28. Yeah, the, uh, holy, the holy trinity. Yep. Yeah, you know, and they, they, they all step right up and they're all beautiful lenses. But you know, a zoom lens at 2.8 gives you a different exposure than a than a, a fixed, you know, a, a, a prime lens at 2.8. It lets more light in. It just does. Interesting. I, I, can't, I can't explain it. It might be a half a stop, might be a quarter stop, but they're they're sharper, they're brighter, they they're they are better lights. I mean, better lenses. Yeah. Uh, and 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 so, but yeah, but all those, you know, and what happened was is that I actually 
I actually was doing a job for Rolling Stone magazine uh, back in the day. I don't remember what year this was, but somewhere in the early to mid mid 2000s, 2005 or six or four or three, or 2000. I'm going to guess 2005 or six. Uh, U2, Bono and the Edge from the band U2 from Ireland uh, were in Cupertino uh, debuting. I don't know if you remember this. There was a U2 iPod that you could buy. It was I like, was working at Apple then, and I have that iPod, by the way. <laughs> loaded with every one of their records on it. Yep. And so Steve Jobs brought Bono and the Edge out and on a stage. It was a press junket, and I was shooting it for Rolling Stone magazine. And, uh, and I had a digital camera because they needed it fast, and I hate those files because they look like crap. You know, they're probably like two megabyte, two megapixel camera uh, pictures, maybe three. And, um, but I didn't, have not invested in a good zoom lens yet. I was still prime. And so I was shooting with my 180 2.8 manual focus. My eyes were not as good as they were when I was a young whippersnapper. I started wearing glasses when I turned 40. So I'm 58, so 18 years ago. And, uh, and I got those pictures back and half of them were out of focus. Oh, I hate that. Yeah. And, there. and it was at that point where I said, it is time for me to invest in an autofocus zoom lens. And I bought my first 70 to 200. Wow. See, uh, yeah, we, I think we've all been there that when you, you're, it usually happens on mission critical jobs, <laughs> like, I, like, I mean, like I, Bono I, and you two and, and, yeah. the, and, and the iPod with Apple. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I did get enough. I, I, I fulfilled my assignment and they got the shot that they ran in the magazine and whatnot. But I was just like, I can't, you know, I, my eyes aren't good enough. You know, I can't focus. And, and I go back and I look at photographs that I took of bands on stage that are super high energy and super high, high excitement and lots of movement going on. And I'm shooting with manual focus Nikon lenses and I'm spot on. Like, okay. You know, we got to talk about that, man. Cause it's like, I, I've tried to shoot with, with limited success, let's say, and not even in a, in a professional manner, but I've tried to shoot some concert photography, just, you know, little local bands or whatever. Uh, and that is hard. Yeah. I mean, that is like, like kudos to to photographers that could do that because it's like, I don't know if it's the most challenging, but it's got to be up there with one of the most challenging genres of photography to try to attempt to shoot because it's, you know, constantly changing light, crowd of crazy, excited people bouncing around, frenetic performers on stage, high motion in, you know, high motion in low light, <laughs> you know, how... Like, how are you able to get such great shots out of that kind of, you know, situation? We have been trained by special forces from the fifth dimension <laughs> to lightning in a bottle. There you go. That's the yeah, dark matter. You guys are shooting with dark matter cameras or something. Practice, practice, practice. You know, you, 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 it's, you got to get, you just got to do it. You got to do it. Yes. Lighting conditions are tough. I mean, it's hard to be in focus at F2 or F2.4 or 2.8 or um, uh, I guess it's 2.5 technically, right? Um, anyway. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, 2.7, you know, yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's tough to be in focus when you're wide open. It's tough to be in focus and sharp when you're hand-holding at a 60th of a second at 2.8 at ISO 3200 with a long lens. Um, yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, this is where you want it to be in focus. You want their eyes to be in focus, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're on a stick, you know, you're in a pit and somebody's on stage and you're looking up at them and you're shooting wide open and you're focusing on their eyes and everything below them is going out of focus, their guitar and their hands and everything. You know, you want to try and shoot straight on so you can, you know, get that, that plane where their face and the guitar may be both in focus and mm -hmm. you want sharp eyes and sharp guitar strings. Uh, but you know, I go back and I look at some stuff that I shot on film that was happening in real time and, incredibly fast and it's in focus and i'm just like i don't know how i pulled that off but you know i was like you know yeah because that's the other thing you were shooting film yeah like, these days you can kind of look at the back and say well you know geez that, that sucks let me adjust yeah. you're yeah. shooting film yeah you're, yeah you're 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 you you know you develop an eye for exposure and you develop an eye for um uh focus and you you know you act like a cowboy in a in a in a shootout you know the okay corral and you're reacting as fast as possible to to you know hit it on the head yeah that's got to be some adrenaline going on there when you're when you're out there and it's okay. just like the yeah 
I can't imagine, you're sh- yeah, especially if you're shooting like a band that you love and you're you're nailing the shots and you're just like, that's got to be the yeah. best feeling in the world, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, think about it. Like, think about people that chase tornadoes, right? And they get a shot of their first tornado. Think yeah. about the, the adrenaline rush that's going on with them and, and uh, you know, um, everything like that where you are shooting what you love. You're shooting sports. And all of a sudden, you know, you've gone from just shooting college games to getting on the field for a playoff game because you get a press credential and you're in the dugout and you're next to the sports illustrator photographer and the newspaper photographer and you're getting that shot of the home run or the the out at home plate or whatever it might be. And it's just like that magic moment that you just captured. And, and you're like, holy moly, I did this and I can continue to do this. And I'm going to, I did it this time and it was this good. And the next time I do it, it's going to be even better and it's going to get better and it's going to get better every time I do it. And, and it's going to get better because I'm going to force myself to learn how to make it better, to practice, to get better. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that that also is, Um, I think that's a lot of photographers downfall is that they don't know how to make their photography better. They are not, they don't have the ability, you know, like I look back on when I first was shooting and I was trying to make a living and shooting professional jobs. Um, I, you know, I looked at that film and I got it back and I was very happy with it. And then years later, as my eye developed and I got better, I'd look at that film. I'd be like, Oh my God, what was I thinking? This stuff is terrible. (laughs) But, you know, whoever was looking at it decided that it was good enough and it worked for them. And it but it inspired me because I was getting positive feedback. And, uh, you know, I go back to earlier work and I say, what was I thinking? Why did I do that? Why did I overexpose it like that? Why did I think I needed such a, a contrasty negative? And, and uh, you know, it's it's all of those things that are going through your head uh, uh, in a split second uh, that gives you that that adrenaline dopamine rush which i guess is exactly why social media works is because it gives these people this this dopamine rush when somebody likes their photo and it's that that reinforcement that you know what you're doing is good and it's valid and and uh but even if it's not right because it's even if it's it's not it's like that 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 social media drip is like a it's like a a morphine drip right (laughs) well yeah maybe maybe it's a methamphetamine drip you know something because when it stops when it stops they're like oh my god i gotta do something to get more of that right And we talked about this last week when we were on the thing is that unfortunately due to social media you know we now live in a world of mediocrity And so if all you're looking at is mediocre photos, then that's the bar that you've set for yourself. And so when I was first starting, I was opening up magazines like Rolling Stone or looking at record covers or going into record stores and looking at albums. And I was inspired by what I saw. And I'd be like, this is what I want to do. How do I do it? Okay, well, this guy probably has a light. And if I'm looking at this photo properly, that light's probably over here. And it looks like there's a second light that's maybe hitting this over here and maybe even a third one that's hitting on the top of the head. And okay, so I don't really, I don't want my pictures to look like a yearbook photo. So I'm going to get rid of that light, but I like those two lights. And I know I'm never going to be able to copy this exactly, but if I go get my lights and my diffusion and my look and my feel, maybe I create my own look and my own style. Yeah, right? I love that. You know, in speaking of your own look and your own style, I want to look at some of your work. Let's so, do it. Uh, with your permission, I want to bring up your website. Please do. And, Hopefully and, people won't think it's mediocre. <laughs> I, I highly doubt that. So let's bring your website up here. There it is. So we're at, uh, at Blakesburg.com, right? Yeah, so, so, yeah, so you can go to Blakesburg.com. And uh, also I have another website called rockoutbooks.com. And at rockoutbooks.com, that's where you can find all my books that I've published. I've done 15 coffee table books of my music photography. And those a bunch of those are on my Rock Out Books site and also my, my for sale print galleries. My website, blakesburg.com, that we're at right now is more – showcasing it to people who just need a place to go. Hey, what's your website? That kind of thing. So I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you who these people are real quick. So we have Jerry Garcia. This yep. is Brian Wilson from the beach boys. Uh, the next shot is, um, scoot it forward there. That's Johnny and June cash. That's James Brown. Stop at those for a second. Both of those portraits are available light with T max 3,200 probably shot at 1600, pretty grainy. The one of James Brown was probably backstage in a, in a dressing room. And just, I probably shot that at a 30 of a second, uh, intentionally because I wanted to try and get a little bit of motion blur. If I remember correctly, 
um, I have like an entire roll of film from this little portrait headshot thing. And that's wow. be on the motor drive. Okay. 30th of a second, 15th of a second, 60th of a second, you know, and just trying to capture like a little tiny bit of motion there. Whereas June and Johnny, I'm just like, okay, I don't want this to be a really, just a snapshot flash on camera with some, you know, extrachrome film. I'm like, I'll shoot this with some grainy black and white film and make it a little bit more, you know, reportage, right? Yeah. Uh, the next shot here looks like it's the blue one is Tom Waits, and that shot with a four by five camera. Uh, that shot with tungsten film and a daylight setting, which goes naturally blue. Uh, four by five camera. You could see his legs and hat are a little out of focus. So I was probably shifting the lens a little bit to kind of give it that, that look. And, uh, you know, just one of those crazy shoots with somebody like Tom Waits. And the, and you captured this blue was not in post, right? Correct. This is, yeah. So this, um, you did that. Okay. Yes, exactly. So this is intentional. This is me shooting indoor balanced film, tungsten film in outdoor open shade so indoor film has a lot of blue in it to compensate for overhead incandescent lighting to give you a natural skin tone, right? And so uh, uh, it's balanced at 3,200 degrees Kelvin, and I shot this outdoors in open shade, and it gives you this blue tint. And so there, this is not done in Photoshop. This is right out of the camera. Wow. This yeah. is great. This is great. Look at this. Carlos Santana. B.B. King. B.B. King with Lucille. Look at that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that. Santana's available light and B.B. King is a strobe lights. And it's in a backstage dressing room at this vintage old theater. And that's like an old movie palace projector behind him and an old phone booth. And I think I had just two lights set up here. And uh, this was like a probably a five to ten minute photo shoot at most. Wow. You just get them for that hot minute, sit yep. down, yep. got to get what you get and then get out. That's some pressure too, just for this kind of stuff yeah, beyond and get being in, like, when they're on stage, that's a whole different world, right? Yeah. You want to get them to react, you know, that's that smile. I probably said something funny to him to get him to react, you know? Yeah. That is crazy. Look at this. That's another four by five portrait of Ani DeFranco, the blue one. And you can see I did the tilt shift. So if you look at it closely, her face and her eyes are in focus. And then it slowly just ble bleeds out of focus there. Right. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, so I was even though I was tilt shifted on my front lens element, I was still focusing right on her eyes. And the depth of field is like barely a quarter of an inch. That next black and white shot is Tracy Chapman in a recording studio. I was doing pictures for a record she was working. How did I know that? I knew, I, obviously you can't tell who it is, but for some reason my brain said, that's Tracy Chapman. Yeah, and just, you know, I just thought that that was a beautiful photograph and I had black and white fast speed film in my camera and, you know, T-Max 3200 and boom. Next shot is uh, John Lee Hooker and that shot with a four by five camera with strobes on uh, an old Polaroid film called Type 55 that they don't make mm. anymore. And that uh, that film actually gives you a negative. So these next two shots of John Lee Hooker and Radiohead, look at the edges of the photograph, right? That's like that top edge right there with that little – those circles. That was the, the – it was actually right below the circles there, those little dots – the film was perforated and it was, you were actually meant to just rip that off the film, but I used to just leave it on there because uh, I liked the way it looked. And uh, the, that top row of circles there. And, uh, but these photographs are shot with that black and white film and that film gave you a negative also. So oh, that's cool. it gave you a positive and a negative type 55 doesn't exist anymore. Wow. This is Emmy Lou Harris, uh, you know, Nashville legend. Uh, the next shot is a woman named Susie Sue from Susie and the Banshees, uh, famous Brit pop singer, band leader. And uh, this was kind of done in a, in a homage to um, Edward Steichen and his photograph of the woman behind the, the uh, lace veil. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. This is beautiful. Look at that portrait. Look at this. This is definitely not a yearbook portrait. Right yeah, here, right? that's an Iggy, you know, and just... He, I, I knew that if he was smoking, it would really bring something out because that's kind of him, you know. Uh -huh. And yeah. so I was like, "Yeah, go ahead and smoke in the studio," even though I wouldn't, don't love it. I just felt like it was, you know, good. And I, I used to light my. Nowadays, I light my portraits a little bit more flat than I used to do. Maybe I'm growing up or something. Um, but uh, this particular shot here, 
is, you know, probably one soft box on him and just one light on the background just to give a little bit of separation between him and the background. Mm -hmm. And intentionally that light a little bit wide, that, that key light on him just so that he would really go into shadow. But I like how you can just sort of see the, a little bit of his eye on that, his right eye and on the, on the left side of the photo and that little dot, which is the catch light in his eye. Yeah. And, you know, before we move on, I'm curious as to how you how are you getting these people? Is it is it word of mouth or you just, is it because you move in certain circles and, Ma you know, and they, they know who you are? It's a magazine assignment. Almost all of those were magazine assignments. I think the Brian Wilson from the Beach Boys one was not. It was a fundraiser event. And he was doing it with another musician who I did a lot of work with. And so I just, you know, I brought one little light with me, a little portable battery powered light on a stand. So when I didn't have to shoot flash on camera and just asked Brian Wilson, if he would just pose for me for a minute and probably shot 10 frames in black and white and 10 frames in color. I love it. Have you, have you seen the work flow change at all or the number of assignments that come in? Has it uh, changed I'm, at all over the years? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and, and, and it's all going to change again with Corona. I yeah. mean, I think a lot of print magazines are going to go out of business. I don't think that they can survive this. Yeah. Um, we'll see how it goes, but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, magazines drop like flies all the time and they become just online or whatever. But, you know, I think the glory days of magazine photography is pretty much over. Uh, well, this is not over, over. Let's take a look at some more of these images because these are these are crazy. You get lost in your portfolio, man. Yeah, Jane's <laughs> Addiction. And then this is uh, Joni Mitchell. And that, you know, that's the blue one. And that shot yep. with the 5 camera. Uh, the next one is the Chili Peppers, and that shot with just a few lights on them, probably two on them, one on the background. Uh, that's when they were little babies back in 1989. Yeah, they're growing up now, huh? <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, just yeah. This is 30, 31 years ago. Wow. Tom Petty, that's intentionally shot with some fast, grainy film at a slow shutter speed. And this was just an, an event that we were all just hanging out at. And I just wanted to get, I didn't want just like a boring snapshot flash on camera, which I could have done, or you know, uh, or even, um, <clears throat> I mean, I wanted this vibe. I wanted, you know, I wanted to try and capture just a little bit of movement and blur. And to me, it works in this photo, yeah. you know, and yeah, it does. And he's iconic. He has an iconic face. So you don't yeah. need to show every bit of detail in him. Right. Yeah. Wow. All Chris, right. Who, that's Chris, oh, I know these guys. Look at this. Black Rose. Yeah. And then, uh, Willie Nelson after that. And oh. then, uh, the, the bus is Neil Young. So when you get the call from a from you know a magazine or you know someone who's hiring you for assignment, what, what, describe what that call goes like. Is it like, hey, by the way, BB King's going to be at so and so, so and so, or well, you know, now, now go over there and get a shot. We right. need a shot. Nowadays, we don't get phone calls. It's all email. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, and then occasionally there. Uh, so hey, are you available on you know this particular date? You know May twenty first. Uh, so-and-so, so-and-so is doing a show in San Francisco, and we've got approval to do a photo shoot for a feature, a cover, whatever it might be. Are you available? Uh, we think it needs to be between 4 and 6 p.m. Uh, you're going to get 20 minutes with this person. Um, sure, I'm available. Let's book it. So then they'll go back and book it with the publicist or whoever, the manager. And then I might have one phone call with the photo editor or art director, like, what are you looking for? Are you looking for anything particular? Do you need more than one shot? Is it going to be an, uh, a big opener in the article? And then a secondary pickup shot. Are you going to just go get a live shot for the, pick and, uh, the secondary pickup shot? Um, and so, you know, you're just trying to get as much information as you can so that you can go and do the job. And, right. uh, you know, and, 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 you know, magazines are paying less and less money. I mean, you know, a lot of magazines might say, okay, I've got a flat $600 that I can pay you to shoot this, but that's includes your assistant and your film and processing, you know, and you might spend $200 in film and processing and your assistant's $200. Why are you going to spend $200 to do it? You know, make $200 to do a job that's going to take you all day. Right. right? And so, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, you just have to, you, you check your, you know, usually it's a availability on a certain date is where the conversation starts. And then depending on who the art director is and exactly what they're doing, it just depends on if they want to give you total creative freedom, ask you if you have an idea that you can share with them, uh, or if you just want to go and wing it and be like, okay, I'm going to go get some, you know, toy glasses and I'm going to put 
toy glasses that say happy birthday i love strippers on everybody's heads and see what happened you know it's just yeah. you know it depends i mean annie Leibowitz was the one who came up with the brilliant you know idea of concept photographs you know that were told a story through wardrobe and setting and and as well as the subject matter i love that i love that so i want to i want to switch gears and dive into the uh so we were looking at shots that were all done in camera right so this was all a film for the most part right mm. so let's i want to switch gears and look at your the new side right so and on your on your website you've got music new here so i'm going to switch over there and go through a couple of these shots right so this this is your digital era right? yeah so, so everything uh, here yes this is all digital of course and this is jackie green and the shot on the right is just on a white seamless 35 millimeter nikon and you can see his legs are going out of focus in the bottom I mm -hmm. have like some tilt shift architectural lenses that I like to do portraits with and mess around with and kind of mess with the with the point of focus. So you can kind of see how those are going out of focus. And that's an intentional creative decision. Uh, the shot outside is just Jackie with some uh, strobe lights plugged into a generator. Um, you know, uh, this um, uh, this shot, next shot inside a little trailer. So this is backstage at um, um at a festival called Hard, Hardly Strictly Bluegrass, that's Elvis Costello. I should have closed the curtains because I hate that those tents that are back there. But uh, it was this little old-fashioned from the 1960s, little like uh, camping trailer, and it was like a prop backstage, like a set decoration backstage. And I asked Elvis to come inside and sit for me. And he came in for a minute and sat down. And I think I shot this with flash on camera, but I'm bouncing it off of the wood ceiling. And it was going very warm. And we, because it was digital, we were able to pull that warmth out of it. Yeah, I love that. It's, yeah, getting these people, like the, these, I'm sure, very busy musicians, to get them to come sit even for like 10 minutes. Is it is it pulling teeth or is yes. it like yeah I want to get I want to get my image made because uh, you know that's how I make my living right like this particular image of Elvis Costello like this was probably I'm gonna say a three to four minute photo shoot uh, whereas go to the next one uh, the next the next shot is a band called Smash Mouth uh, you know they had a couple of really big hits back in the '90s uh, Walking on the Sun and I'm a Believer and All Star. And I shot a bunch of their really early records, and uh, this was a publicity shoot I did with the with the band. This is, at this point, this has got to be almost seven or eight years old. Uh, but this is outdoors with you know multiple lights, multiple strobe lights. And since they hired me, like I probably spent five hours with them. Um, mm. We probably did five different locations, and uh, you know wardrobe changes, and indoors yeah. and outdoors, and vertical and horizontal. So. It was a real photo shoot. It was a regular yeah. photo shoot. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's go through a couple more, and then I'll I'll let you go. Or is Dave Matthews? This was for the cover of Acoustic Guitar Magazine. Yeah, and, this one right here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the next one is Les Claypool, and that was for. I think actually Les hired me for that to make new publicity photos for him. Uh, is what that shoot right there is. Wow. So you, you probably know all these guys, right? I mean, not uh, for the I, most part. I, I mean, this is Paul Simon. Yeah. This was actually shot for Apple Computer. Um, oh. you know, for their original Apple music series as they did. And uh, oh. shot digitally with a with a uh, phase one back on the back of my Hasselblad. Wow. This is ridiculous. Look at these. Who are these guys? This is a band called Blind Pilot, and they're an alt rock band from the Pacific Northwest. And this was down in Texas. And their manager asked me if I would do a quick shot of them. And I had no lighting with me or anything like that. And so I found a location where I could put them on this porch, and there's light coming in from the side. You can kind of see, you know, just looking at uh, the guy on the right. I look at all of them. You can see where the light's coming from, right? Yeah. yeah. Out, out there. And I believe. If I remember correctly, I believe that, and this is a long time ago, I might have even popped a little bit of a flash off on this just to give it a tiny little bit of fill. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, but you can barely even tell. And you know, it's not often that I do portraits like that where I'm do mixing available light with flash on camera. Uh, I'll do that in event type situations, but not in my portrait work. I mean, in my portrait work, I would, if I was doing a full shoot with these guys, I would have had umbrellas and power packs or soft boxes or beauty dishes and my assistant and 
you know, it would have, it would have increased the size of the crew and, and the production and everything, yeah. uh, having all that equipment, but I didn't have it with me anyway. I was down at South by Southwest in Austin, just shooting the event for a, for a client and they asked me to do a photograph. So. I love that. So of all these shots, you know, and there's a mountain more, right? Because this is like we said, a story there's a mountain. Yeah. yeah, a mountain. So actually, do you have a do you have a favorite, you know, like a favorite shot? Yeah, You're like, oh, I nailed it. I guess yeah. my favorite child is, you know. So, yeah, yeah I, you know, my my website's got, uh, you know, a handful of images in it. I was actually just talking with my daughter today about updating my website. It's time. Um, I just have a few logistical things to figure out about it. But um if you really want to see what I'm working on all the time and a combination of old and new, uh, go to my Instagram pages. So I have one that's just Jay Blakesburg, uh, B L A K E S B E R G Jay Blakesburg. The other one is called retro Blakesburg and retro Blakesburg is a brand new Instagram site that my daughter is curating for me. And so she has it all set up and she's choosing the photos and writing the captions and whatnot. And that's retro Blakesburg. And we just started that a few weeks ago. So it's only got, I don't know, a thousand followers and 50 posts or something like that. And my regular Instagram is Jay Blakesburg and I've got, you know, 60,000 people following along and a lot of people. So that's where you want to go. And then on Facebook, I'm J at Blakesburg dot. I'm sorry. I'm at J Blakesburg photography, not J Blakesburg on Facebook. Yeah. So, uh, here's a bunch of stuff that I, I post regularly on Instagram, uh, you know, that drummer there in the middle, that was his birthday. So I posted for him. He's a friend of mine, that sunset shot Oops. there, yeah, uh, yeah. uh, that, that on the left-hand side, uh, yeah, yeah. with a girl. So she's one of the biggest pop stars in Italy. She's called like the Madonna of Italy. And, uh, uh, I shot an album for her a number of years ago, that shot square with the Hasselblad on film. Um, yeah, so that's, wow. That's Instagram. I love it. I love it. So let's look at this one. Yeah, come, come join the party. Oh, yeah. And then Retro Blakesburg. This is what my daughter is doing it. So uh, like here, go all the way on the top row on the right. Top, no, no, top row. Right. So that's a series of Polaroids. These mm -hmm. are all shot with a four by five camera. Right. Yeah, I guess for some reason it's not letting you. Uh, I guess you have to log in. It's not letting you actually get into it. But it's a series of 10 Polaroids shot with a four by five camera. And these were all employees at a clothing brand called hot topic a clothing company a retail uh chain oh, yeah yeah and I, I shot their annual annual report three four years in a row and we always use their employees as our models because they dress like the product like their customers and so this is a series of 10 polaroids that i did and then i handed those four by five polaroids in as final art so it's not like i did them as test polaroids i did them as final art polaroids and then handed those into my client to scan and decide if they wanted to use them that's so killer, man. That's that's awesome. Congratulations on, you know, all this stuff. So what's what's next uh, for what's Jay Blakesburg? Ne uh, yeah. What's next is we got to get through Corona. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, um, I publish self publish my own books. Yeah. Uh, I've done fifteen coffee table books. You can go to rockoutbooks.com to check those out. So I'm I'm looking at long 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 term projects right now. I'm looking at uh, several book ideas. Um, going through my archives and pulling stuff out for some of these ideas. Uh, I'm working on a book of another photographer's uh, work right now. That's another thing my company does is that we packaging photographs. Um, we package, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, packaging books. So we package uh, books for other people that want to self-publish their books. So we can do everything from design to printing to uh, trucking and customs and overseas shipping and, and things like that, getting it into your warehouse. Uh, so we like to help, uh, my company helps other photographers independently self publish coffee table books. Uh, so I self publish all my own books as well. Uh, and so I'm working on a couple books that are just at the very early stages. Um, I'm selling fine art prints of my work. So that's nice. keeping me a little bit busy and books and shipping that stuff. Uh, you're busy. Darren, you, got, like, you got stuff to do. You got bring out the you, million, 1.6 million digital files that I have in my computer that I haven't geez. looked at in five or 10 years. And just, and just looking at it in, in amazement and being like, I can't believe I shot all this stuff, you know? Yeah. I yeah. work with, you know, this artist, Snoop Dogg or Dr. Dre or the Grateful Dead or Tom Waits or Neil Young or Carlos Santana. And so I feel very fortunate that I've been able to work with all of these people 
you know, over and over and over again and, uh, and, uh, create a body of work that resonates with me, uh, through the beauty of social media and Instagram and Facebook. I have learned that my work resonates with, um, the people that are looking at my work and people like it and they enjoy it. And it's a good distraction. And I love sharing my work. You know, I remember, I remember back in the day when we all shot film, you know, I was at a, a concert in San Francisco and, you know, this, you know, at the time I was probably 30 years old and, you know, maybe 35. And this kid next to me is like, Oh, who are you shooting for? And I said, Oh, request magazine. That was a magazine based in Minneapolis that came out through Sam Goody music stores. And he's like, uh, and, and I was like, Oh yeah, the new issue has a story on this band. And he's like, Oh my God, I just got that issue. And I have those photographs torn out of the magazine and hanging on my bedroom wall. You know? <laughs> awesome. And, uh, and that was social media back then, you know? And, and so, uh, wow. like I know photographers that took pictures and threw their negatives and their slides in, in shoe boxes and put them in the closet. And I was taking pictures so that people could enjoy them. And that's why I still post so much stuff on social, on social media, because I want my friends and fans, if that's what you want to call them followers, um, we're not a cult, uh, to, to enjoy what I'm doing and look at what I'm doing and get something from it and, and let that, let that photograph take them back to another time and space that was so important to them, like at a specific concert or, a uh, um, uh, you know, an event that they were, ha- they were at or, you know, jazz fest or whatever it might be that they can kind of reconnect with that moment through that photograph. I love that, man. Well, congratulations on all this stuff. You have a lot to do. Um, you've got the energy to do it. You've got the talent to, to and the horsepower to make it happen. So yeah. con- congratulations on everything you've done, what you're doing and what you're going to do. So, yeah. And keep doing what you're doing. I'm excited. Thank you. So, yeah, man. Well, thank you for coming on. Thank you for coming on. Like I said, we'll link to all your, your Instagrams, uh, rockoutbooks.com, J, uh, blakesburg.com, all that stuff. We'll link to it in the blog post in the YouTube description for this episode. Yep. And, and, and keep doing what you're doing, man. I'm going to, you know, I have a feeling we're going to have to talk again because there's yeah, a million. Hey, we didn't get into we archiving, get into you know. We didn't get into anything. We just, we skimmed. We skimmed over. There's so much more. You always know, leave them wanting more. Always I, leave them wanting more. Yeah, I shot close to a million images on film and, you know, and another, they got a million six, million seven digital files. And, wow. and, uh, uh, you know, we've scanned about 80,000 pieces of film. And so, um, yeah. you know, I've yeah. got, I've got a stack right here on my, on my desk of proof sheets and this stack of proof sheets here, I'm going to show it to you this stack of proof sheets. This is only about, uh, quarter to a third of what's on my desk this is just film that i shot that i want to go back through and see if there's anything on there that i want to scan and get into the computer and and uh um you know get get digital turn it digital man so that we can share it on social media um yeah because they're trapped right now right they're trapped on the negative you gotta you gotta set them free yeah so you know no shortage of projects no shortage of things to do um and uh Hopefully the world will get better soon. It will heal itself. Um, hopefully we will we will get people to run our country and our countries that care about our environment and care about our people. And we'll come back bigger, better, stronger than we were. And our economy will thrive and, and uh, we'll get back to work and be able to make amazing photographs once again. I have no doubt that all that is going to happen. So, Jay Blakesburg, thank you so much for coming on. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you in part two of this. So we got to do it again. (laughs) Anytime. I'm ready. All right, man. You take care. Be safe. Thank you. Cheers. This is Twitch.